<laughs> Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to welcome you to uh, this uh, symposium entitled uh, Journey Toward Entailed uh, Transcatheter Therapy Selection with Focus on Repair. Uh, but on both uh, the mitral and uh, tricuspid uh, valve. Just a few words of uh, introduction. As we are all aware, valvular heart disease uh, is an important disease manifestation, mainly uh, degenerative in, in nature, and both uh, mitral as well as tricus tricuspid regurgitation are rather prevalent in the normal population. Here you see figures above uh, 4 to 10% in those 75 years or older. If we are turning first to the mitral valve, uh, as cardiolo cardiologists, it's important uh, to look at the work that has been pioneered by the surgical uh, colleagues in studying the mechanism leading to uh, mitral regurgitation, first to classify patients in primary and secondary mitral regurgitation, but then also carefully looking at the mechanism in order to optimize uh, the outcome for any repair technique. Now, the natural history of patients with mitral regurgitation is summarized on this slide. And for both patients with primary MR, but also secondary MR, prognosis is worse as compared to matched patients that don't have severe mitral regurgitation. And that poses the question of whether there are any therapies available. Certainly the standard would be medical therapy, but unfortunately, again, for primary MR on the left side and secondary MR on the right side, patients that are under optimal medical therapy continue to have high recurrence rates as it relates to rehospitalization, incidence of atrial fibrillation, and subsequent uh, surgery. So clearly, there remains an unmet need despite the fact that medical therapy is installed. Another consideration relates to surgery, and there is a difference as it relates to primary mitral regurgitation or secondary MR. There are no randomized clinical trials to address this question, but there are observational data suggesting from propensity score matched analyses that in the setting of primary MR, actually surgery does normalize the outcome of patients relative to those that don't have MR. Conversely, with patients in secondary MR, there is no data to support that surgery is effective. Now, the reason we are here to discuss transcatheter techniques is that an unrelated problem is the undertreatment of mitral regurgitation. And that has to do with the advanced aged frequent comorbidities and the reluctance in general to undergo open surgical uh, procedures. And in that context, a series of uh, uh, de uh, devices have been developed basically to mimic surgical techniques that either repair leaflets or cords uh, apl are applied to the annulus or in combination of uh, thereof. Now, the device uh, that has been studied the most uh, in more than 100,000 uh, patients since uh, the introduction in 2003 is certainly the mitric clip, and therefore we will focus a little bit on that device during the remainder of the symposium. And it is also one that has enjoyed um, uh, clinical evidence uh, supported in the ESC and ACC AHA uh, guidelines. Now, just to put the numbers in perspective relative with other uh, transcatheter techniques, you see that any other technique is uh, still in the development and that obviously the number of patients uh, treated are much on an, a smaller uh, scale. Now, there's considerable excitement regarding the transcatheter edge-to-edge uh, edge repair because we also have now high-quality evidence from randomized clinical trial, both in the setting of primary and secondary MR, and we are going to discuss this in more detail. But I think one highlight that anybody can appreciate is that the intervention is exceedingly safe. And I just show the example of the, of the uh, Everest 2 trial as compared to surgery where it was superior, but here also against the performance standard in the COAP trial, where you see that actually this procedure can be performed with a very low uh, rate of uh, complications. Now, this slide is just to indicate that there continues to be also iterations in the device uh, development. And I think that's important to keep in mind if we judge uh, studies from the past, that there continues to be a device iteration. And we will discuss this in more detail. But the, the advent of the XTR uh, device is notable by providing a longer uh, clip arm uh, and gripper uh, length. 
Turning in the second part of the uh, symposium, we will turn our attention to functional uh, uh, tricuspid regurgitation. And this is just to remind you that indeed it has been largely neglected in the surgical community. Here you see the overall prevalence in the United States and then the proportion of patients that undergo surgery, which is rather negligible. But here on the right side, more importantly, patients under actually undergoing heart valve surgery that at the same time would have an indication for tricuspid regurgitation are also not systematically uh, treated. Now, there's many uh, intrinsic challenges to the tricuspid valve that are listed uh, here. Certainly, it is much more variable uh, anatomy. Uh, the patients not only present with three leaflets, there may be even uh, more. There's the proximity to other structures, including uh, the AV uh, node. Frequently, patients uh, present with advanced uh, disease, and technically, it is more challenging in terms of visualization by, trans uh, by transesophageal echocardiography. And finally, we also have the issue with uh, the ICD or pacemaker leads. Now, in analogy to uh, the mitral valve, there's a host of approaches, techniques, and devices that are applied to the tricuspid uh, valve. And this is an interesting uh, summary from Maurizio Taramasso, just recently uh, published in Jack Intervention, which gives you an, an, uh, an impression of the frequency distribution of these various uh, techniques. And I think it's easily appreciated that two thirds of the current experience relies on uh, the uh, mitral clip uh, device. Now here we will also discuss one uh, device in more detail that is more custom made for uh, the uh, intervention at the level of uh, the tricuspid uh, valve. You see here the uh, modifications with a more acute curve angulation and shorter sheet, uh, and sheath and modified knob arrangement to facilitate uh, the uh, intervention. So this is just meant uh, as a short uh, introduction and I uh, need to make you aware that there has been a slight change in uh, the uh, program. Unfortunately, Dr. Stone is unable uh, to join us uh, for uh, personal uh, reasons. He excuses himself and uh, we will try our very best to uh, replace him. But uh, I would like to take uh, the opportunity to perhaps call on Saibal Carr, who is in the uh, audience and has a limited um, uh, period of time to stay with us. But notably, Saibal is not only one of the uh, most experienced uh, implanters but he also has contributed immensely uh, to the co-apt uh, study. And perhaps before leaving Saibal, you can uh, uh, share uh, with uh, us your imp uh, uh, experience in the framework of the, uh, the co-apt uh, trial. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, before you actually show the co-apt trial data, and I think most people have seen the co-apt trial data, uh, this trial is probably one of the most difficult trials that I did in my career. It was, um, I think we started in 2000, it took us five years to enroll, but what's most emotional <clears throat> for me was to have enrolled the highest number of patients of 46 patients, to have seen the 22 patients in the medical arm not only die but to suffer, and to not allow them to get treated and to be rolled over after two years was very difficult. And I remember very distinctly one of my patients, I, I had 22 patients in the medical arm and 14 died over the period of four years and only six died in the medical device arm. So it was, it was no more an open trial for me. And I actually tried to stop the study. In 2017, I asked Greg Stone and Michael Mack that we should stop the study. The DSMB came back saying that it was, it was not clear yet, and so they continued the trial. We were, of course, right. And I remember very clearly one of the patients was a neurosurgeon. And he ran, and he was quite senior, and he randomized to the medical arm. And he suffered three times with heart failure, and they went to renal failure, and he died. And his wife came up to me and said, you used my husband as an experimental guinea pig. And I will never forget that. So it was a difficult trial, and um, you're going to share the experience with it. Um, I think at the end of it all, these, each when you see those kaplan Mac curves, and when you see the separation, think of them not just scientific lines, but think of them as the people who have suffered and died for a larger cause. That's it. Okay. Yeah.
Now, so uh, thank you, uh, Saibal. Saibal is a very practical person. He goes immediately into uh, the clinical histories. I rather thought he would uh, discuss uh, the trial he has presented yesterday, which I think it was very important to provide some more mechanistic uh, information. But thank you for that, uh, uh, Saibal. So I tried to do my best uh, to present uh, what uh, uh, Greg Stone would uh, do much better as the principal investigator of the COAP trial. But really, the idea is uh, to review quickly the MITRE FR study, the COAP study, and how they fit uh, together. As you know, last year at the ESC, the MITRE FR trial was presented basically in randomized clinical trial one-to-one -one between MITRE CLIP with medical treatment versus medical treatment alone in 300 uh, uh, patients with the primary endpoint of all-cause uh, death and unplanned hospitalization at one year. You are all aware of uh, the uh, primary endpoint result, basically of no significant difference, but with a very high event rate at uh, one year. Now, one thing that is frequently overlooked and is here the, uh, displayed in the forest uh, plot, if you look, there's one subgroup and that is patients with previous hospitalization less or more than twice. And if you look at those patients who were hospitalized twice, at least twice or more, you see actually that there is a treatment effect and that the p-value of interaction is close uh, to be uh, significant. And I think I'm coming back to this issue because I think it has to do with previous uh, medical uh, treatment. Now here you see uh, the mitral regurgitation on the left side for the interventional arm, on the right side for the medical arm, and actually it did work the intervention, although perhaps uh, uh, to a degree which could be improved, but nevertheless at discharge 80% of patients had uh, only grades 0 or 1 mitral regurgitation. But what was surprising was that in the control group there was a tremendous symptomatic benefit. Now obviously you need to subtract those patients who, did, uh, who died, but nevertheless uh, patients were highly symptomatic, that is NUHA 3 or 4 in 70% at the time of inclusion, but minimally symptomatic, or only 30% were highly symptomatic at the uh, time of follow-up. And that asks a little bit the question how well patients were treated at the time of inclusion and brings me back to the forest plot indicating that there were also patients that were just hospitalized once and perhaps not on a fully optimized uh, medical uh, treatment. Now, if you're moving to the COAP trial uh, on surface, it's a very similar uh, um, uh, design that is a randomized trial between MitoClip and medical therapy or medical therapy uh, alone. But there are uh, some uh, differences. First, the patient population is uh, double in size, and importantly, uh, the primary endpoint assessment was at uh, two years. And here you see now the outcome which is different. Here the primary endpoint is just all-cause hospitalization throughout uh, two years, and you see a highly significant uh, a more than 45% relative uh, risk reduction, which is consistent across all the major subgroups. But importantly, if we look at the uh, uh, all-cause mortality, we also see that there's a significant uh, difference, again, with a relative uh, risk reduction of uh, 38%, which translates into a number needed to treat at two years of only a six. And if you look at the uh, composite of mortality and rehospitalization, you see even a more imp uh, potent uh, uh, outcome for the intervention arm. Now, if you put these findings into perspective, then you see what is called the evidence-based uh, optimal uh, medical therapy consisting of ACE or ARP inhibitors, beta blocker, aldosterone antagonist, uh, then resynchronization therapy, and the more recent sacubitrial valsartan therapy. And if you look at the number needed to treat for all-cause mortality at the various time points, you see that mitriclip, as, uh, as substantiated in the COAPT uh, trial, actually contributes conservatively and it is important also to highlight that none of these trials have been performed exclusively in patients with secondary mitral regurgitation. Now, beyond the clinical endpoints, uh, there were other I would say important outcomes, and that is that the proportion of patients referred for heart transplantation or those undergoing left ventricular assist uh, device implantation were also favorably uh, influenced.
Now, if you look at the outcome, I think there are two important observations. If you look at the echocardiographic outcome at 30 days, we notice uh, that 94% of uh, patients actually had uh, uh, no or only uh, trace uh, mitral regurgitation. But importantly, that outcome was also maintained in, also in all the uh, uh, survivors through uh, two years, uh, which is uh, notable. Now, this is a presentation Saibal has given yesterday, and I think it's very important because it provides some mechanistic uh, explanation. And this is the stratified outcome according to residual mitral regurgitation as assessed at 30 days for the overall population. And you see that patients that have persistent MR grade 3 or 4 have a very high event rate for death or first hospitalization. And importantly, that observation is consistent whether you look into the mitoclip intervention arm or the medical intervention arm without no significant uh, interaction, indicating that there is mechanistic implantation that if you do eliminate or succeed in eliminating mitral regurgitation to a significant degree, your outcome is uh, significantly improved. Now, importantly, beyond the clinical outcome and echocardiographic outcome is also quality of life. And here you see different uh, matrices, and you see that the uh, patients alive with moderate or large improvement are all uh, proportionally uh, better in the interventional arm as compared to the medical treatment uh, alone. So how do we explain uh, the uh, differences? On the left side, we have mitral FR basically for the death and rehospitalization without significant uh, differences. And here you see the outcome at one year to make the comparison with mitral FR, but also uh, at uh, two years with a large uh, treatment uh, effect. And certainly there are important uh, differences as it relates uh, to the procedure and what I would say uh, operator experience. First, if you look at the proportion of patients with no implant, the acute result, the one-year result, and the uh, number of ad, uh, adverse events, you see that the outcome was better in the co trial as compared to the mitral MR. This certainly does not ex explain all of the outcomes, but it certainly is one uh, um, a part that may be important, particularly if you just keep in mind what we heard from the presentation yesterday of the uh, component of patients with uh, um, uh, persistent uh, mitral regurgitation grade 3 or 4. There also were, in terms of inclusion criteria, uh, important uh, differences, and that is that patients with very advanced heart failure, ACCHA stage D, on left ventricular and systolic dimension or in excess of 70 millimeter were excluded, which is at variance of uh, patients included in mitral FR. Now, here on the left side, you see that basically there were no relevant differences as it relates to age, uh, the proportion of ischemic versus dilated cardiomyopathy, left ventricular ejection fraction, and uh, others. But if you look at the effective regurgitant and orifice area, you see that it was by one third larger in the co trial, but reciprocally, the left ventricular and diastolic dimensions were by one third smaller in uh, the patients uh, that were included in the co trial, indicating that uh, the underlying mitral regurgitation was more severe and that ventricles were less uh, proportionally uh, dilated. Now, this is an interesting uh, 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 sub group uh, uh, splitting according to the effective regurgitant area, where you see here the proportion of patients less than 30 in co with a very low number, but 52% in mitral FR. And here you see, uh, conversely, patients with an ER for, of more than 40, and large proportion, 41% in co and small proportion in mitral M FR. But you, if you look now at the mortality <coughs> at two uh, years stratified by EOR less than 0.3 or EOR more than 0.3, then you see that they actually in uh, co there is no significant difference uh, between the interventional arm, whereas in patients with uh, the more severe effective regurgitant area, there was an, a significant difference, and the same applies uh, for the endpoint of heart failure uh, hospitalization throughout two years, where you don't see large differences here on the left side, but you do see a large treatment effect in these patients with more severe uh, mitral regurgitation. So I'm summarizing that uh, COAPT is uh, the first study that demonstrates that transcatheter mitral valve repair can significantly improve uh, survival of uh, selected patients with systolic heart failure and secondary MR who have exhaustive medical treatment options. I would say that COEP and mitral FR provide complementary guidance for patient uh, uh, selection. 
demonstrating which patients with heart failure and secondary MR are likely or less likely to benefit from MR reduction. And importantly, and I think that has been buttressed by uh, the data presented yesterday, severe MR should no longer be regarded as an innocent uh, bystander of uh, the underlying ventricular disease, but as an important uh, contributor to the deleterious uh, outcome. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Stefan. I think uh, you set the stage for the next presentation. We have Patrice Guerin who is uh, coming to share with us the experience of the French uh, uh, operators who have been uh, exposed to mitral FR. And really, I think it's important to have a direct contact with his own experience and have a case presentation from him. Patrice, thank, thank you. you. So uh, my uh, disclosure, and I would like to thank uh, my colleague echocardiographist Nicolas Piriou for his large contribution to this uh, presentation. So the secondary MR is not a valvular disease in itself. It is a consequence of uh, uh, a disease of the left ventricle with left ventricle dilatation, annulus dilatation, papillary muscle displacement, and cardiac tethering. And moreover, there is a drop in terms of mitral valve closing force reduction. So as a consequence, if you want to treat the functional MR, you have to treat the left ventricle itself. And maybe sometime, and we have to define the time, you will have to treat the mitral valve regurgitation itself because we know that it is a poor prognosis uh, outcome when it does exist. So you have to take in account that uh, it depends a lot about ventricular loading condition. Here are two echocardiographies. There's only 20 minutes between this one and this one, and just 40 milligrams of furosemide. And you can see that the functional MR disappears between the first echography and the second one 20 minutes later. And it depends on the cardiac remodeling and optimal medical therapy. On the left, you can see the echocardiography of a patient two months after myocardial infarction with uh, severe functional mitral regurgitation. And on the right, the echocardiography of the same patient two years later under optimal medical therapy. So you can uh, make disappear the functional MR thanks to the medical therapy. And if the functional MR stay, if it is always severe, so you have to evaluate the degree of this, the, the severity of this functional MR. So you have to know the area of the regurgitant orifice. You have to know the left ventricular ejection fraction, and you have to know the left ventricular and diastolic volume because there is a relationship between these three points. But in the European guideline, you, you can find only one point. It is that it is a severe functional MR if you are over 20 square millimeters. So I would like to share with you two cases of passion of mine with uh, an area over than 20 square millimeters. The first one is a 69 years old man with a primary dilated cardiomyopathy under CRT and optimal medical therapy. And he was uh, stable with a NYHA grade 3 with severe MR grade 4. Here are the echocardiographic data showing an airway at 29 square millimeter and a left ventricular and diastolic volume over 300 millimeter. So the left ventricular ejection fraction was uh, 23%. We decided to treat him with mitral clip therapy. It was safe and it was efficient to treat the functional MR, but we observed no tiny improvement for this patient in class, in functional class. And the patient died five months later, uh, despite the treatment of this mitral regurgitation. So how is it possible? We treated this uh, factor of bad prognosis, and he died five months later. So I have this other patient. It is a woman, 78 years old, with a dilated cardiomyopathy. It seems to be the same patient with uh, under CRT and optimal medical therapy, NYHA grade 3, and uh, with this severe MR grade 4. Here are the uh, echocardiographic data showing a clear 
high-grade functional MR with a left ventricular and diastolic volume 178 milliliter, AROA 41 square millimeter, and a left ventricular ejection fraction 45%. So it seems to be the same patient, but a more dilated ventricle and a higher AROA. So we decided to treat her like for the first case by using mitral clip therapy without any complication. It is a safe procedure. We know that from registry and studies, clinical studies, with a very good result because it is efficient to treat functional MR. And we know that again from all uh, registries and uh, studies with a residual uh, MR grade one. And we obtained a dramatic functional improvement of this patient without any rehospitalization. And this patient is still alive six years later. How is it possible? It seems to be the same patients, but it's not. The first patient is here in this representation of Greyburn and Co. The case number one, you are in this green area of non-severe MR with uh, left ventricular ejection fraction 23. And if you calculate the ratio between the AROA and left ventricular and diastolic uh, volume, you are very low. It is a patient with a non-severe MR. But the second patient is in this uh, area, the red one, because the ratio between AROA and left ventricular and diastolic volume is relatively high, 0.23. So here is in the area of disproportionately severe MR. So these two patients are definitely not the same patient, as these two studies, Mitra FR and COAP study, are definitely not the same studies. The results of Mitra FR and COAP studies are often considered as contradictory. But it's wrong. Mitra FR and COAP studies are complementary. The question is not to know if mitral clip therapy in functional MR is safe and efficient, because we know that it is always safe and usually it is efficient. The question is to know exactly what is the target population for this uh, therapy. So Mitra FR and COAP do not oppose, but want to respond together to this question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, uh, for these interesting cases, and I'm sure there will be discussion. Uh, but we first we have the representation from Francesco, how to translate the findings actually into some uh, practical guidance, and then we are coming back. And please uh, feel free to post questions uh, via PCR uh, React after Francesco's uh, presentation. We will have time for discussion. So I think. Uh, uh, we all uh, have been exposed to this uh, dramatic question, who is right, COAP trial or mitral FR? We keep on hearing this uh, complementarity, but still, I think there is a little bit of uh, confusion. We are confused. I am confused, and our referring cardiologists are confused. This is a PCR poll asking the community after Co-opt and mitral FR, what do you think is going to be increase of, of indication, decrease or no change? And you see there is a little bit of a spread opinion. What do we do with that? Well, in Europe, it is uh, 10 years, more or less, that we treat functional MR with mitral clip in a pretty somehow liberal fashion. We have been uh, expanding indications to the case number one that uh, Patrice just showed us, end stage hopeless patients trying to get some palliation. And uh, maybe less often we have been exposed to patients with preserved ejection fraction and severe MR. We have some data which we collected in Europe, uh, initially with uh, the, the preliminary work from France and then in a more uh, larger cohort with the access registry showing that uh, patients after functional MR treatment with mitral clip get uh, some uh, 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 clinical benefit in terms of uh, better um, uh, quality of life and uh, functional capacity. The background of treating functional MR in uh, heart failure is uh, well known. I, don't, I will not go too much into the details. Just to <coughs> clarify, however, that functional MR is not the unique component of prognosis, is not the unique component of the symptoms. It is a one of the many components, 
But obviously, uh, it is also an active uh, actor in the ongoing developing uh, volume overload condition that will somehow increase the chance of uh, ongoing remodeling. MR is bad for the ventricle for many reasons, but not only for the ventricle. Don't forget it's bad for the atrium, it's bad for the pulmonary circulation. You know, with MR you have reduced cardiac output, you have ongoing volume overload, you have left, left atrial remodeling and uh, substrate formation for atrial fibrillation. You increase the pulmonary pressure. You know, patients with severe MR are non-compliant to therapy. You have acute decompensations, and we know that every, pa every time a patient goes to the hospital, the chance of going back to the hospital within one year is 50%. And there is overall lack of efficiency when the mitral valve is leaking. So that is why we believe that if you have this problem, you should fix it. Initially with medical therapy, you know, reaching some eovolemic conditions, but in case you don't reach decrease of MR, I think uh, we need to do something else. So when you see this picture, I ask yourself, you ask yourself, when you see these pictures, do you see something wrong? It is the valve or it's the ventricle? Is fMR a problem or is just a bystander? For many of, other, of our non-interventional colleagues, the problem is just the ventricle. FMR does not exist. And I think this is the main issue here that this we need to uh, discuss. I, I will be very provocative now. So when I, sh I, showed you, I showed this picture today to you, but in two days I will show the same picture in the Heart Failure Association. I will say, do you see the difference between the two, these two pictures? We all know that smoking kills. It is on the package. And after co-op trial, which is a very specific proof of concept trial, I think the first time in 20 years of functional MR treatment, we found a causality effect of functional MR and prognosis. And I think today we should say severe MR will kill you, just like cancer, silently. Initially, this patient remained asymptomatic. And then after a while, after a while will become patient number one, hopeless. After many attempts of different therapies, they come to us, can you do something? And we do something with pleasure, but it doesn't work. And you know, people say, you know, but people can live long with, with MR without symptoms. There are always outliers. And you see this famous picture for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, which has been used a lot of times. You know, even smoking sometimes doesn't kill you. But oh, we know there is a lot of data that fMR is associated with bad prognosis. And so after, I think, uh, the, the outcomes of the co trial and after the standing ovation, which was very emotional, now we are six months after this presentation, and I think we know a little bit more. First of all, in the field of heart failure, there is no such a trial which has been able to demonstrate such a strong effect on mortality. There is no one single trial with such big effect with one single therapy and in a specific subset, subset of patients. I was, four, four years ago, was presented the Paradigm HF, which was defined the leapfrog, the most important trial in heart failure. And then I saw this uh, uh, Kaplan-Meier curve, which I think, you know, there is a difference in mortality in, in five years in a population of 10,000 patients. You can see a p-value, p less than 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, but do you see the real effect? If you compare this therapy to other proven heart failure therapies, this is the one that has the highest impact in decrease of mortality and in the number needed to treat to save one life. I will not talk too much about co-opt versus mitral FR. There are a number of questions, and there's been a lot of debates, but we need to move forward now. So what do we do with these two trials? First of all, the question, you know, I keep on hearing this uh, sentence, they are, they are complementary. Thank you. So what? Do we know who is the candidate? Well, if you look at the uh, plot, 
analysis, the forest plot analysis, you can see some subcategories which are more responder, less responder, but still, uh, do we know who are the patients who really benefit from this therapy? Yeah, this disproportionately severe FMR is a concept. More MR, more chance that the patient will benefit. But then I ask you the question, how do we define severe MR? So, sorry, I made a mistake, one second. So this is a similar, uh, Patrice, a similar example that you showed before. It's the same patient morning and afternoon. Morning, no severe MR, afternoon, moderate to severe MR. Is this patient a severe MR patient or a mild uh, MR patient? So MR, a functional MR by definition is fluctuant. It's very difficult to catch the time to define. You know, this patient can be today severe, tomorrow mild. How do we define this? And I think also when we look at the outcomes, they are all Doppler oriented. So we all discuss about this color. What do you know about the hemodynamics? I think hemodynamics is probably a very important topic, and neither co-op trial or, uh, of MITRA-FR have been collecting hemodynamic improvement after MITRA-CLIP. And I think this, in our experience in the last two years, plays a bigger role. We need to understand we are not treating colors, we are treating pressures. We want to unload the, pre the, the ventricle. MITRA-CLIP is like Entresto, is unloading the ventricle, unloading by preloading reduction and afterload uh, improvement. So the problem, in my opinion, is not how much. The problem is when. The problem is to define the right timing and help our colleagues to have some positive uh, impression about this option for these patients. These patients have a very high risk of dying, and we can propose a very low risk procedure that can help these, uh, these patients. Because this procedure is not an alternative to LVAD or transplantation. If you treat this patient at this stage, it's not going to work. It's going to be just like patient number one. A very important uh, improve, uh, 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 new knowledge has been developed in the last few months. So we have been seeing that those patients with less MR, larger ventricles, don't have any survival benefit compared to those with more MR and smaller ventricles. We know that. And uh, if you look at these two categories, two, group one is those patients with an ERA less than 30 and, and a volume more than 96 uh, uh, milliliters per square meter, and group two is those patients with more MR, smaller ventricles. Huge difference in the primary outcome. But what about quality of life? Even in group two, those patients who have large ventricles and less MR in co-op trial, they have an improvement of quality of life as compared to the control group. And you see also six minute watt test improvement. 12 months is a very short period, but you have a sustained and, and measurable improvement in quality of life. Obviously, you will not change prognosis if you treat this patient so late the ship is already gone. So my lessons learned. Co-op trial is a very specific experimental proof of concept trial, very well designed, probably not replicable to all the population. It confirms the synergy of drug and device therapy in heart failure. You know, mitrochy by itself doesn't work, it has to be associated to proper pre and post procedural treatment. You need competence centers to provide safe procedures and good outcomes. The problem is that these results probably are not generalizable in, in all, the, all our patients. However, what we can state, this is a safe procedure, and therefore this procedure may save lives in a measure which is higher than any other medical therapy and can improve quality of life in a large majority of patients. So the whole thing is about patient selection is all about good heart failure therapy and good procedural skills. Our role is to be good, safe, and effective, which means no complication, no residual MR, no gradient, and durable results. And last but not least, 
convey the message, MR kills, and kills silently. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. We have a few minutes to discuss uh, the cases uh, Patrice has uh, uh, presented. I'd just also like to introduce our expert uh, panel, Georg Nikenik from uh, Bonn, Stefan uh, von Badeleben from Mainz, uh, Patrice uh, from uh, Nantes, and Philipp Lotz uh, from uh, uh, Leipzig. Maybe a quick uh, question to the audience before we go to the cases. Uh, who believes that secondary MR is uh, causally related and impacts outcome. Uh, raise your hand. So just the plea uh, Francesco has done. So not so many, and who does not believe it is causally re uh, related? So uh, there seems to be a, still a, many undecided, I would say. So it's difficult to vote. Uh, we, we see that every day voting is not so easy. But let's come to the cases. Uh, Patrice, the, you showed two interesting cases. A uh, quick question, uh, were they included in MITRE FR? They both were part of MITRE-FR? No, they were not in MITRE-FR, no. Okay. And uh, in MITRE-FR, can you share a little bit, um, you know, the medical regimen? So, yeah. so, you know, how were patients treated? I tried to make that point on that forest plot that there were also a considerable portion of patients that actually uh, just had one manifestation of, of heart failure. Can you share with us a little bit the detail of medical management? I think uh, really that patient in Mitre FR study was were uh, too serious, too severe, and uh, with uh, um, too large left ventricle, too too large uh, um, a ratio between AROA and uh, left ventricular and diastolic volume was not so high. So probably that it was not only not really patient really at risk um, due to this uh, functional MR. I think we are in the bottom of the gravity of the severity of this pathology, but uh, I think that co-op study is in, on the top of this uh, severity grade. So, and probably there were too many centers to implant uh, devices. So in some center, it was just the beginning of the learning curve. So that could explain a little relative blah, bad, bad or um, Mm, relative wor worst results than in the co-op study. But, uh, and the problem for me is that uh, we do not have any data concerning the evolution of medical therapy. And it's not the same if you can uh, decrease uh, the, the, the drug during the, during the study, and we do not have any data concerning this point. Perhaps a question to, to Georg or Stefan regarding that very first patient uh, that apparently in that uh, single case uh, did not uh, benefit. How, how do you see that in your practice? Would you have treated that patient uh, or are you in view of the data no, more reluctant? I think there are many components. Uh, so one of the components is whether there is remodeling capacity or if there's worsening of the remodeling. So, so we have to speak about transmural infarctions and other issues that may be involved in these patients. Um, I, I think we also have to consider that even in the group of less than 0 0.3 centimeters square, there were with smaller ventricles responders. And as uh, Francesco pointed out, we also had quality of life and also six minute walk test improvement. So I think it's very hard to only pinpoint to one single parameter like error A, which is difficult to define in functional disease, uh, the decision whether to treat or not to treat. So I think it's the whole picture of the patient in patient selection. But, uh, but sorry, yeah. potentially yes. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I think we have probably three groups. Uh, the first group are the other patients with really severe mitral regurgitation which will benefit and which have still a life expectancy by all means of more than one year. Then there is the second group. This is an easy one. This is the co-opt uh, the, the uh, cohort, if you will. And then we have the second group, which is on the other side. Uh, which is uh, is futile, which is cohort C, uh, which has an ejection fraction maybe below 25%, uh, several comorbidities, right right ventricular issues, tricuspid, bap, 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 and all this stuff. And this patient probably should not treat. But I think the most difficult group is in between. This patient may have only moderate MR, but he, 
may still benefit. And therefore, I also think we should not run into this m mistake that we should only treat patients from now on with an arrow above 30. We should be sure that this patient is on a stable condition and that he still has symptoms which we can relate to MR and even moderate MR. And then it, this would be still a candidate for me. I, I think this is a very important point because frequently what we are presented with an echo finding of moderate MR, but the patient is symptomatic. And frequently, the uh, imager never asks the question, could it be severe when the patient is under different uh, conditions? So I think, in a sense, we would need to stress more if the patient is symptomatic, ask the question whether that MR could be, uh, could be severe. Perhaps one, I just wanted to ask the two of you, because you responded to that. My question would be, in that very first patient, does it modify the way you work up the patient? So in other words, would you consider you know, looking at contractile reserve? Would you consider an MRI to look uh, for fibrosis, uh, you know, would you look more to tricuspid regurgitation, other contributing factors? So, you know, would you a priori say that's not in patient anymore, or would you say just invest more in, in diagnostics uh, to, to, to be fine, uh, not to include him? Very, very open questions. I mean, TR, all the patients with severe TR were excluded from both trials, so we don't know. Probably TR is, is a denominator for poor prognosis. And I'm not sure, I, I would buy your argument about uh, remodeling. Uh, th that makes a lot of sense for me that these patients may not benefit, but all of the patients did not have an, an, an improvement injection fraction and they still benefited in the co-op trial. So therefore, this argument may also fall short. So I don't know. Well, I think that is one thing we can say is that the safety profile of this procedure has uh, uh, lowered our bar to do pre-procedural uh, workup. You know, if this patient would have been a surgical candidate, which was the fact, let's say, 10 years ago, we were treating this patient surgically, all this patient will undergo MRI, uh, stress test, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, dobutamine test to see if there was contratile reserve and so on. This was fundamental because it would uh, predict survival, surviving the operation. This is not anymore the case with these procedures, which are super safe, and so we have not done this. So, you know, the, your question is very well taken, but there is no evidence whatsoever that any of these uh, uh, examinations pre are predicting one year survival, unfortunately. I think we should do more. Yeah. I agree with you. I, I just would also say the current theory of uh, uh, disproportionate and proportionate MR also needs to be validated. Yeah. I mean, right now it's an editorial on tertiary MR. I think we have an excellent question uh, uh, from the audience, uh, and I need uh, somebody with imaging expertise uh, to address this, and that is the reproducibility. And I think that's an excellent question. I always wonder myself, you know, patients with idiopathic uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, I think it's rather reproducible, but in patients with ischemic, cardiopathy and eccentric uh, jets, I, I have uh, my, my doubts. Who, who wants to address that question? I think it's very important to say that uh, many of the measurements, including regurgitant volume, are highly variable. Uh, there is an error of about 20% yeah. in repeat measurements uh, in these findings, especially in functional disease. Uh, what is very nice to see is that not only LV volumes were reported, but LV volumes indexed to body surface area. And actually, we should do the same with regurgitant volume. It makes no sense to have an absolute volume cutoff of 45 milliliters, because this is absolutely and even more dependent on the left ventricular volume that we uh, emphasize. So I think the guidelines have to be changed to really use indexed values like we do them in aortic disease and other disease forms. OK. Any comment? How reproducible it was in M uh, mito FR? Uh, do you know that? Reproducibility is a very good question. I think that we have to wait for MRI study because it could be more interesting. But I would like to understand, to underline the fact that uh, we need stress echocardiography probably because sometimes I have some patients with a relatively bad result but a clear improvement in uh, current life. So, and we, when we did uh, the new um, stress echocardiography, there were no improvement of uh, mitral regurgitation during exercise. So that is probably a very important point. Also, the error at rest is important, but what about the error during the excesses? 
Absolutely. Uh, so I think I, we need to move forward. Just Sorry. one, just Gerard. one comment. Just one comment, my friend. Uh, no. These things are very extremely important, but I think the most important takeaway is we have to be sure that the patient is symptomatic from MR first and second. He has to be stable on optimal therapy for at least three months before we make a decision. Yeah, I think uh, these are you know, the ongoing discussion. We need to move forward. Unfortunately, we, we, we could uh, talk for half an hour. We need to. Uh, have uh, uh, Rodrigo Esteves, which will talk about uh, the next generation mitral clip, which has an impact probably on what we are talking about, because one of the key elements of survival is uh, patient, patient responding to therapy. And with more options, maybe we can change this, uh, uh, this, uh, this factor. So, uh, Rodrigo, please. So good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Now uh, we're, we're moving now to the to this uh, more technical presentation uh, about uh, this uh, improvement in the in the clip device. So uh, this is my conflict of interest. Now we are talking uh, about as provided as with these two different sizes of the clips, NTR and XTR, and uh, the clip catheter itself has as well uh, been improved to be more precise and has increased the, the working length uh, to allow us to be more forgiving with a transeptal puncture. So I want to go through some uh, cases just to show you how these improvements can work in a standard procedure. First case is a complex case. It's a uh, as you can see, it's a, a P1, P2 prolapse. Uh, with myelin or calcification and short PML. Usually, we uh, what I have learned is that we tend to use the NTR clip here because in the commissures is fully crowded of corda. We don't got to uh, get entangled there. So these improvements allow us a precise positioning of the clip uh, about the target zone. And uh, the, the device now is stiffer, so you can enter more precisely in the commissure without getting entangled. Uh, you can do orientation, that is better as well. Uh, and then you can treat the lateral commissure, and then uh, with another uh, NTR clip, you can treat the central prolapse to uh, achieve that result without a significant gradient. So the patient came to uh, apparently no MR after the procedure. Uh, we treat as well, we, we have learned that uh, uh, XCR has expanded our, our treatment possibilities in very complex uh, diseases. Look at this uh, uh, complex A2 uh, flail that is uh, very large and very broad, that is beyond the Everest criteria, of course. But uh, the technical improvement uh, has allowed us to treat us safely these cases now. We can uh, precisely position the clip over the target zone. Uh, very important with when we use XTR is to assess the perpendicularity. We have to be really perpendicular because minor changes in perpendicularity can affect the result because uh, it can create uh, larger distortions. With the clip uh, fully open, you can see in the uh, right panel how the, all the leaflets are inside. So the grasping is much easier and a lot of tissue is inside. That uh, large flail was controlled with one clip. As you can see, it came to a massive MR to just traces with one single clip. So this is a huge improvement. But we completed the treatment with controlling the anatomy, controlling the prolapse, as you can observe here, for a, a very nice result. I think this is very complex anatomy that can only be treated now with this improvement in the device. And uh, the combination of both clips uh, uh, can be used as well uh, to treat complex uh, functional cases like uh, this that I'm showing you with severe central MR with uh, long leaflets but a huge gap with a patient with torrential, uh, with torrential MR. In this case, what, uh, to, to close these gaps, uh, what I use uh, to do is to combine both clips that are also important. Look now how we can precisely position the clip. The trajectory now is very stable, no diving anymore. That this is a huge improvement. Again, very important when you use XTR uh, in these cases with FMR with high, uh, large annulus dilation, that uh, the clip should be very perpendicular. It's most important before closing the clip. Look here how the leaflets are fixed with the XTR. It's very important when you treat this. Uh, this uh, uh, large annulus dilation, that you close the clip very slowly and release the tension while closing, because this uh, will reduce the stress over the leaflets that is quite important. Uh, 
the result with a single clip was quite all right, a huge reduction in, in, in MR, but we want to go further, so we completed the repair with uh, an NTR uh, in the lateral and the medial side, just to uh, create more uh, surface of coaptation without increasing the, the tension in the leaflets. The result of the lateral clip is quite all right, very precise positioning, but still some gap in the medial part that was completed with the uh, third NTR clip. Uh, with, uh, I think, very good result, as you can observe here, the pre and post. So these cases were very, very, very difficult a uh, long time ago, but now it's really doable in a very short period of time. So to conclude, NTR and XTR evolution expand our clipping possibilities, and we can now treat very complex anatomies, uh, tailoring the approach to the patient to obtain optimal results. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo, for these uh, nice uh, case illustrations. We would continue with uh, the anatomical considerations, and uh, Stefan uh, von Badeleben would uh, provide us uh, with uh, some more uh, insights regarding the selection of the respective device. Dear uh, Stefan, dear Francesco, thank you very much for having me. And I would like to continue actually uh, in the same issue about the anatomic considerations for the new clip size selection. These are my disclosures. The MitraClip system, as you've shown in the past, has been uh, safe in over 90 or 100,000 patients worldwide. And there has been an expand study to really look in the use model of the third generation MitraClip systems. You've already seen the two iterations, which is the MitraClip NTR with an arm length of nine millimeters versus the MitraClip XTR with an arm length of 11, uh, 12 millimeters. So it's important to know that we have five frictional elements in the NTR system and six frictional elements in the XTR system. The minimum length of leaflet that should be included to achieve full sealing is at least two thirds or 70% of the arm length uh, as leaflet length. So I give you two examples here. They're pretty much the same that you have seen by Rodrigo in the previous talk. And one is that in primary MR, we most often in the central portions of the P2 or in the A2 segments, we need the full shortening of the excessive tissue that is there in fibroelastic deficiency or in Barlow's disease. On the other hand, we have a situation where we should look into different exact anatomic cut planes uh, into um, the mitral valve. And the posterior mitral leaflet length actually decides also which device to use. So it's very important to have a very tangential view to this leaflet. Yes, you can do this with three-dimensional data sets. And you see here at the P2 segment that we can easily define the length of this leaflet. So if this leaflet is less than or equal to 10 millimeters, it is better to use an NTR system than an XTR system, while if this leaflet is longer, you can also use an XTR. The second thing is leaflet, the intercommissural diameter, as you can see here, which actually defines with the width of the clip system, which is five millimeter, the maximum number of clips used in this pathology. So I give you some examples here where we have severe tethering. So in this example, you see a large tethering area, you see severe regurgitation. And here it makes sense also to use rather the NTR system uh, in order not to induce too much leaflet stress. On the other hand, we have a different pathology that's just recently been recognized, and this is annular dilatation in more preserved left ventricular function with LA dilatation. And here it makes a lot of sense also to use with less tethering of leaflets, as you can see, but massive regurgitation to use less clips, but the longer clip arms, which is the XTR system. Um, this has already been shown in the NTR exp DR experience to date. So there have been over 13 to 15,000 procedures so far with the NTR and XTR since approval. And there have been 1,040 patients enrolled in the expand observational study. At the lower part, you can see that given in yellow in DMR, the use model of the XTR system is more prevalent in degenerative disease with flail or prolapse situations, while it is less prevalent in the functional disease where we face much more tethering of the leaflets. 
I give you two short examples. So this is a small valve. We have um, an annular width of only 3.4 centimeters. You see a central jet in the A2P2 region. You can appreciate this here. You see the tethering. You see a calcification and a very short posterior leaflet. So the natural course, and you can also appreciate this uh, opening of the valve in three dimensions. So the natural course here is to take a short NTR system, to place it in the central position, slightly medial, and you can see that we achieve an excellent result without any MR after treatment and no gradient whatsoever, so less than three millimeters of mercury. On the other hand here, we have a very large valve with um, an intercommissural distance of 4.5 to 4.7 centimeters. So in this situation, you can place more than one clip and you use the large clip model. You can see it's an excessive relevant uh, regurgitation that fulfills the co-op criteria. You can nicely see the pseudoprolapse situation and the tethering of the secondary cords. While we already have a pseudoprolapse of the anterior leaflet, we use the longer clip systems because we also have a long posterior leaflet. We use the second clip here, also an XTR. You nicely see the slight V-shape and you see that we get trace MR as a residual outcome. So we already heard in the talk by Rodrigo that we also have to release tension during closure. This is because if you increase the arm length and you stay with your clip in a certain position below the annular plane, you elevate both arms more into the left atrium. And what happens, you see here, we put the clip into the leaflets, we then close, and Rodrigo already pointed out that we have to close slowly, because if we're very fast, we will elevate um, the leaflets here in the mid part near the cooptation, and we will cause extreme stress on those leaflets. So it's better to deep dive a little bit, three or four millimeters into the ventricle while closing, and this keeps the tip, the hypermochleon, of the mitral clip in the annular plane, and you cause no additional leaflet stress. So a very important procedural finding. Analyzing and looking at a steering committee meeting for the anatomic considerations between XTR and also the use model, as you see here in the first 500 patients in the expand trial, you can see that XTR only was predominantly used uh, in the A2P2 position. It was also very predominantly used in two thirds of the cases if we envisioned a large flail situation, so degenerative disease. While if there's calcification and the leaflet cannot respond or MAC um, and the leaflet is very short, you see that the predominance goes over to the shorter and classic system length of nine millimeters, which is the NTR system. Smaller pathologies though can be treated with both approaches. So the beauty of the XTR can be that you need less clips than with the conventional NT or NTR system and treating in the commissures is predominantly used with the NTR system. So there are more complex anatomies that can be treated and you see this leads to the recommendation that the longer leaflet favors XTR, A2P2 favors XTR, large flail favors XTR, and redundant leaflet like in Barlow's disease. Short restricted leaflet like in functional disease favors NTR, calcification, smaller area, and the commissures. So this is my take home messages. We now have two different clip sizes available, and DMR with flail uh, fo focus, uh, focuses on XTR, central location as pointed out in XTR, restrictions, NTR, a very severe regurgitation can be treated with one XCR only. This may also be applicable in small anatomies. And if you're in doubt, and if the PML is less than 10 millimeters, and you're early in the learning curve, try NTR first. Thank you very much for your kind attention. So thank, thank you, Stefan. I think it was a, a good overview, uh, particularly for those who are not yet uh, involved in, uh, in the new generation. There is time for one question. We are a bit over time. If, if anybody has uh, some technical questions, otherwise we go back to this uh, uh, React to PCR question. I would like to uh, turn to uh, my uh, co-moderators, co uh, my panel. So uh, is, if FMR origins from the ventricle, is the solution a ventricular uh, approach? Uh, first of all, I mean, I can start giving my perce perception. Uh, the, these are uh, 
new therapies which are in the, in the very early stage of, of uh, experience, we don't have a lot of experience, uh, they could be uh, hypothesis generating. In surgery, there are very few examples of uh, ventricular only approach. There are uh, on and more and more cases uh, with uh, combined mitral and ventricular approaches. Uh, obviously, is an alternative. What is uh, your opinion, guys? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I would not agree entirely. Obviously, it, it isn't secondary manifestation, but I think what it ignores is the volume overload, the chronic volume overload. Absolutely. And I think if you look at another pathology, aortic regurgitation, the key is that you catch the uh, volume overload related to aortic regurgitation at an, fi at an stage where the left ventricular remodeling is not reversible. But if you intervene early enough, uh, there is benefit. And I think here the, the, the point is that MR begets MR, so uh, the volume overload uh, uh, f leads to a uh, phase where you have more and more adverse uh, left ventricular uh, remodeling. Obviously, you arrive at a stage where you may be too late, and then ventricular assist devices uh, are uh, uh, indicated. But I would take issue to say, I, I personally do believe um, that uh, the data we have available now, also from the uh, data that were presented yesterday regarding the residual mitral regurgitation, that I would not say it's solely a ventricular issue. Yeah, and anyhow, these therapies may be in impacting also MR by remodeling the subvalvular apparatus. But again, these are very that is very preliminary experience, and I think uh, it will be very difficult to beat the safety profile of a leaflet approach. This is something which is, I think, more important than efficacy. In this field, safety drives the decision. Uh, these are very fragile patients, and the, the main question again is the timing. To take the decision to go for a more invasive approach is not easy for many of our colleagues and therefore I think safety becomes probably the main driver for the indication. Anyhow, we have to move forward because we are a bit uh, over time and uh, we switch uh, uh, to uh, the other side of the, uh, of the heart. So we go from the, from the left to the right. Uh, so if there are confusing situations, imagine what, what happens on the tricuspid side. There is ongoing experience, and I think Georg has been uh, leading uh, in, this, uh, in this field, and he will uh, report to us about uh, the experience with the Triluminate uh, uh, study. Well, thank you very much uh, for the invite and the introduction. Could I have my slide? Yeah, these are my uh, disclosures. So as mentioned, I would like to share with you the data of the triluminate trial. It's on percutaneous edge-to-edge -edge repair for patients with tricuspid regurgitation on the behalf of all the, uh, the co-investigators uh, mentioned here and also sitting uh, in the panel. As you all know, tricuspid regurgitation is as frequent as mitral regurgitation and is associated with poor prognosis, as you can see here. A very equivalent, very similar to the schemes you have seen for the mitral regurgitation in patients with or with heart without heart failure, in patients who have been treated, for example, for mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, still drives poor outcome, for example. And, and we don't have a good therapy available so far. We are prone to medical therapy such as diuretics, and we have high-risk surgical approaches, especially in the redo situation, and therefore minimally invasive catheter-based procedures may be a promising tool for these patients, and it has been shown in some, in some post-talk analysis that there is at least premise for, for this type of treatment. This, uh, this um, device has been shown already, already by Stefan, that is the triclip, a reiteration of the well-known mitroclip. It has just a bit a different bending uh, features and, uh, and an additional knob in the new iteration to make it more feasible and more in a better trajectory to be used in the tricuspid space. Other than this, is, it is uh, quite the same and we had to use in this triluminate trial, I should mention this also, the smaller clip, not the XTR clip, which would be of course desired to be used in this large valve. So objective of that trial was to look at safety and performance, obviously, of that device in patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation. It was a feasibility study, if you will, prospective 
single arm multi cent and 21 signs in Europe and the United States. We enrolled 85 patients. We had an eligibility committee looking at each and every patient, comprising of interventional cardiologists, cardiac surgeon, echocardiographer, and also heart failure specialists, looking at the patient and at the stable and appropriate treatment before uh, we made the decision to enroll this patient. And all the data which I will share with you were core lab adjudicated in terms of echocardiography. Co-primary endpoint was employed on effectiveness. We looked at, at the uh, rate of patients to be uh, reduced by one grade at least uh, for tricuspid regurgitation. Trial was powered for this and of course we looked also at safety data. Major inclusion was symptomatic heart failure symptomatic patients on the grounds of, of moderate to severe tricuspid regurgitation and of course patients who had something else to do on the left side, who were unstable, acute coronary syndromes, who had a severely impaired left ventricular ejection fraction below 20% were excluded from the trial for futility or for being unstable and not being able to show a, a treatment efficacy in that setting. So this is baseline criteria, 77, 77 years old on average, most of the patient being, being female, 66%, almost every patient suffering from atrial fibrillation, a very common finding for tricuspid regurgitation. And in many patients, this is also the driving force of, of the tricuspid regurgitation development. Here we have the additional comorbidities, which are uh, not too severe, but this patient, uh, we are very sick, as I will show you in a second, on the second part of, of this graph. Are we dilation quite considerable, more than 5 centimeters, tops are reduced to 1.4, so severely impaired right ventricles, and despite the fact that the left side was preserved, left ventricular ejection fraction almost normal, these patients were doing really poorly. Here look at six minute walking test, 277 meters only, and if you look at the anti pro BNT also, severely elevated to 3,600. Tricuspid uh, regurgitation grade, I will, I will share that with you in a second. Let's look at the procedural data, the, at the acute procedural data on the table. We were able to implant successfully and also retract afterwards successfully the device, uh, the catheter and, and the guide in 100% of the patient, which speaks also to the proper selection by, by the eligibility committee. And we were able to reach the acute procedural success in 91% of the patients, meaning that we reduced TR by at least one grade in almost every patient. And the device time was uh, pretty acceptable at 75 minutes for this very early experience in this, in this very complex patient. So where, uh, how many clips did we use? Uh, in 20% of the patients, we used one clip. In almost 50% of the patients, two clips and in one third, roughly 30% of the patients, we used three or four clips. Most of the clips went into the anterior septal commissure, which makes a lot of sense because there usually the tricuspid jet resides because the lateral wall is pulled, pulled apart from the septal wall, if you will. And this is also applicable to the posterior septal commissure where there is also a significant part of the jet sitting and there also um, quite a, quite some extent of, 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 of uh, clips were implanted in the frame of the study. So how did we do in terms of, of tricuspid regurgitation change? This is core lab adjudicated then after 30 days. And in 86% of the patients, we were able to use TR by one or even two grades, as you can see here. Only a few patients, and we enrolled quite a bit of patients with torrential TR, left the hospital with still severe TR. And this is more a detailed view on the, on the TR grading before and after the procedure, after 30 days. Uh, 94% of the patients entered the trial with severe, massive, or torrential TR. And as you can easily appreciate here, almost 60% of the patient had only moderate or less TR after the procedure within 30 days. So very satisfactory results, again, for this early, early experience with a small clip. 
This is echocardiography uh, in detail. I won't go through that uh, too long. Arrow, regurgitant volume, you name whatever parameter you can see and find here for quantitative assessment of TR was highly significantly reduced. And this ended up also in a reduction of the, of the annular diameter relatively acutely within 30 days we had a uh, highly significant reduction maybe due to the to the pulling force also of the of the of the clips but maybe also evidence of early positive remodeling and as a consequence of reduction of tr regurgitation cardiac output uh, was increased and this led, of course, then also to clinical consequences to improvement in the patient. This is heart failure symptoms assessed, assessed by New York Heart. And as you can see here, 75% of the patients up front in New York Heart 3 and 4. And uh, amazingly, after the procedure, within 30 days, 80% of the patients in New York Heart 1 and 2. So an extreme uh, benefit for the patient clinical-wise. And this was mirrored also by the cell assessment in the frame of the KCCQ score looking at uh, quality of life and heart failure symptoms a highly significant increase by 14 points which, which is quite meaningful in this patient group safety uh, no cardiovascular mortality Francesco was referring to this to this major issue of safety in this procedure no all-cause mortality no need for conversion to open heart surgery no stroke no myocardial infarction we had some single leaflet device detail some increased gradients in, again in this early period in this very early experience without any clinical consequences for this individual patient so I may summarize I think we saw a very high implant and acute procedural success rate in that trial 91% of the patient had a TR grade reduction of one or more and there was a significant increase in patients categorized at New York Heart Class 1 and 2, so with just a few heart failure symptoms remaining, and there was also significant improvement in KCCQ at low complication rates. So we believe that the Triluminate study was able to show that the edge-to-edge -edge device is a promising tool to treat patients with tricuspid regurgitation, and obviously we need to follow up this with larger studies in randomized trials. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you. We we now look at one case. Uh, Dr. Lutz will uh, will show some tricuspid implantation, so do, do, so that we get into the the reality of this new procedure. And afterwards, we will have some time. I've seen already some interesting questions coming from the audience regarding the clinical value. So, Philip. Yeah, thank you, and thank you um, foremost for having me. Um, this is my disclosure slide. So now I will jump from the scientific part of it, the triluminant trial. It's now going towards um, to the procedure. On the left-hand side, you see a transthoracic, uh, a, a trans um, esophageal echocardiogram with a transgastric view, where one sits at the bottom of the RV, looking up towards the tricuspid valve, and by this we can nicely appreciate the septal leaflet, the anterior leaflet, and the posterior leaflet. We have three leaflets now on the right. And typically, that slit-like cooptation defect is very often seen in functional TR. Now, the triclip procedure is a concept which obviously is derived from the mitral valve and then um, tr um, transferred to the right side with some modification to the technique and to the device. One which should be mentioned is that the, um, the guide and the GDS, they are not now curved um, orthogonally, but they are rotated by 90 degrees to allow better steering on the right side of the heart. And then also the guide and the tip of the guide is moved a little bit more distally and that gives us more distance to the tricuspid valve and more height, which is important for this procedure. The investigation and ev evaluation of this procedure has been um, mentioned already within the Triluminate trial, so I will go right into the concept of the procedure, but before doing so, let ourselves just quickly remind of what the, how this had been done surgically and still is done. There are three um, 
the more concepts, but I picked these three concepts. One is a commercial application. The other one is the clover technique, where all three leaflets are connected with each other, and then foremost and most often performed the annuloplasty. Now, if you want, so you could argue that with the triclip procedure, you can mimic all three of these surgical approaches. Um, the first would be, and, more, um, and most often performed, is a clip implantation between the anterior and septal leaflet. And if you implant two or three clips, as in this case, you really do sort of an um, anteroseptal plication, as shown in this case. What's also done is a clip implantation between the anteroseptal and the posteroseptal um, leaflet, which then will end up similar to um, what's been done surgically, like a clover technique. And for both approaches, whenever the anterior or posterior leaflet is connected towards the septal leaflet, the RV free wall is pulled over towards the septal leaflet, and therefore I dare to say that we also add a sort of an indirect annuloplasty, very obvious in this patient where we implanted two clips and you can see that the RV free wall moved towards the septum, reducing RV dimensions and annular dimensions. Now, two out of these three cases were treated within a triluminate trial. Um, we all eagerly await the availability of the commercial device, hopefully end of this year, with some other steering modification and also additional sizes with a larger clip similar to the XTR clip, which will be very beneficial, especially for those with large cooptation defects. Until then, patients with no other treatment options can be treated on a compassionate use basis with the XTR microclip. And um, in the remaining two minutes, I would like to show you such a case that's a patient where you can see that the main TR jet is centrally, um, not so much tethering and good leaflet motion. So our strategy was to place two clips anteroseptally and therefore um, and thereby close up the central cooptation defect. As for procedures on the mitral valve, also here on the right side, it is very important to have a perpendicularity to be 90 degrees in two planes. That's an inflow outflow plane and then the, um, the X plane, the corresponding X plane view um, on this side. Only if that is assured, the tricuspid valve should be crossed echo and fluoroscopy guided. After this, the echocardiographer is asked to switch from esophageal to transgastric. You can here see a very nice transgastric view. It's not always possible, but in most patients it is possible. And only when the clip is in the right position between septal and anterior, we open the clip. So we always cross the valve with the clip being closed just to avoid entanglement in cords, which is probably the most important procedural um, complication or, or um, risk to, to avoid. So we've done so. This is mainly seen on fluoroscopy, not so much on echo. And this is because we asked the echocardiographer to stay at the level of co-optation, and then we slowly pull the clip into the image. We pull the clip up. You can see that in a second. Now you see it coming into the image. And we also see already that there is rest restriction in mobility of the anterior leaflet and the septal leaflet, suggesting that these two leaflets are on the clip. Then again, echo, um, echo view is changed to a transesophageal for closing. And now on this view, you can see the septal and anterior leaflet both nicely on the clip. We then very uh, slowly um, and slightly close the clip before we put down the crippers. This um, seems to be quite helpful not to um, push um, away the leaflets while closing. Crippers down and then again very slowly, we close the clip and closely watch tension on the leaflets. And this is what we would like to see. So in this area, no TR anymore. And then similar to the first clip implantation, the second clip implantation 
and then after that we had this result, so plication antraceptally and only very mild central residual TR. So that was the triclip procedure within five minutes. Thank you. Okay, so I think it's time, uh, time to react. I would like to start with this uh, question that comes from the audience. Uh, can we have the, the question on the, on the screen? The question was, what symptoms count for tricuspid regurgitation? And how about the spnea that might be multifactorial in heart failure patients? So this is an interesting question because I, I don't know, I mean, I am a bit ignorant. I was expecting these patients to be mostly uh, hepatorenal failure and so on, but most of these patients come with heart failure uh, symptoms on the left side. They look like uh, left side heart failure and dyspnea, and after the procedure they get a little bit less dyspnoic. Is it also your experience, uh, uh, Stefan, uh, Philip? What is your experience? Is, is, are these patients uh, benefiting only on the, let's say, right side, or there is also benefit on the left side? I'll have to say that we, we do have about one-fourth of patients who really present with um, recurrent ascites, and there I think it's, it's a little bit easier to know what's, what's the problem. Then almost all of them have um, therapy-resistant um, peripheral edemia, um, which do not resolve after diuretics and come back very often. And what we also very often have is um, pain, in the region of the liver, which is probably due to chronic liver um, um, congestion. And these three symptoms, for me, they are very likely due to, to the right side backward failure and not so much to, to the left sided um, forward failure. But obviously, in, 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 a, um, in a significant proportion of patients, it can be difficult to differentiate between left and right. Well, there is a, uh, let's say, one parameter which is a pretty common seen in uh, many of this, the, the trials in, in the in the three valve registry, which is a multi uh, uh, multi device, multinational, multi center registry on uh, all board, uh, all uh, all across the border technologies and techniques for mitre, uh, for tricuspid repair. One thing that you see there is an increase in NYHA class, and one of these is probably because of increase in stroke volume. There is an increase in cardiac output, basically, uh, which is not uh, uh, surprising. I mean, uh, the two circulations are in series, and if one, if the right ventricle is not pumping efficiently, then you, and if, if you can improve it with tricuspid uh, interventions, then uh, you can improve the cardiac output. I think the symptoms are quite unspecific and what we see is unexplained an inability to exercise. So, so patients having an ejection fraction on the left heart side of 45 to 60% with, uh, with a severe TR, they typically have a six minute walk that's significantly reduced and that's also something we saw in the Triluminate. Actually those patients had a mean uh, LV ejection fraction of uh, more than 55%, 59 to my knowledge, and they had 277 meters uh, walking distance. The same was true on the tri-band, actually, the cardio-band uh, situation. Leg edema, I would uh, say absolutely the same, and I think also um, mal response to diuretics is also quite a good parameter, uh, which can increase uh, either by the elevation of the systolic pressure and the lowering of the right atrial and venous pressure on the other side, so the amplitude for renal perfusion also gets better after treatment. That would be another point that I'd like to raise. So uh, this is a very specific tri triluminate. I think in the real world, the patient we are seeing for tricuspid interventions a little bit more advanced stage. And uh, if I think the main issue here again is uh, the timing for the indication. Is it clear for you? Do you do you have a clear idea? Do you think there is an upper limit uh, for saying it is a futile procedure? I mean, you in Leipzig, you have a large volume now of these tricuspid interventions, and maybe, you know, also you, Stefan, in, in Bern, you have a, uh, experience with multiple devices. I would like to hear your experience. What, when do you think it's too much? Would you say this patient should not be treated? I think because of the, the anatomical requirements to do the procedure, the, the patients we treat with, uh, with the triclip procedure, they aren't, as you said, they aren't the most 
extreme end spectrum of the disease. Um, and this is probably why we see such a really unifying dramatic improvement in symptoms because they, they aren't treated too late. Um, we also have very, very few patients with, um, with uh, liver cirrhosis. They do have liver um, fibrosis and congestion, but they don't have liver fibro um, cirrhosis. And um, as, as seen always in, in surgical um, 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 series, when there is liver cirrhosis, um, when there is severely reduced RV function, when there is severely um, RV remodeling with severe tethering, that irrespective of whether you're technically able to do the procedure, then I'd say that this is too late. One final comment. Well, I, I just would say those uh, disease manifestations, recurrent ascites, severe peripheral edema, that's really end stage. Uh, and, and I think uh, those patients we treat mostly for palliative uh, reasons, but I think it still remains a very valid uh, reason because the patients are desperate uh, for some kind of care. But I think the reason we don't recognize the valve uh, earlier is this ambiguity and difficulty uh, in symptom allocation to the tricuspid valve, and it may be also the reason why we underdiagnose it. Yeah, I would like to add that there's a, a huge role for invasive right heart catheterization in this population. So we actually treat no patient without an invasive right heart cath. So you have to really look for the VEG pressure. You have to look for the absolute systolic pressure in the studies. Typically, all systolic PA pressures above 65 millimeters mercury were excluded. Yeah. And also, primary hypertension and precapillary hypertension really have to be looked at cautious because there, the pulmonary pressure will rise before the lung if you if you really seal off the tricuspic valve. What is beautiful with the selected patients in Triluminate that we had no right ventricular failure, I think, which is a good sign for repair compared to early experience with replacement in the tricuspic field. So excellent. I think uh, you, you know, the final discussion underlines the complexity of the field and the, the potential for really for, for some scientific uh, 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 work in the next year. We need to answer a lot of questions. There are a lot of questions coming from the audience which underline uh, you know, the role of uh, right ventricular function, uh, the role of uh, uh, right heart realization and so on. I think we went into all the steps of the, of the discussion. We started with the uh, co-op mitral FR uh, conundrum and, and, and the, let's say the, the, the confusion generated by the new knowledge. It's a good thing to be confused because it means that we, we have to start thinking. We, we, we are now in the next step of the procedure. We, we're becoming more mature. We've seen also the technology improvements which will probably facilitate uh, adoption of this therapy and probably will improve our outcomes. We touch base on tricuspid side. So I think we got uh, a, a good overview of the current status of uh, lifted repair in uh, atrioventricular valves. And I thank you all for excellent presentations and for your patience. And I hope you see you soon again in this, uh, in this arena. Thank you very much.